I would like to open today's event by acknowledging that we are all on native land that originally belongs to indigenous people. The music that we played in the opening is from R. Carlos Nakai, Grammy award-winning flutist of Navajo and Ute heritage. I invite you to also learn more about the native land you may be on and take a moment to recognize the history of indigenous people. I am currently in traditional indigenous territory that is of the Massachusetts nation. My name is Orlando Watkins. I am the vice president of programs at the Boston Foundation. And I would like to thank everyone who has joined us today and for taking the time for this very important conversation. The events of the last year have helped foster both a humility around issues of justice and equity and stoke a curiosity about the actions that will lead to meaningful change. These moments of clarity for BIPOC folks are not new. The unjust and inequitable systems in this country are very familiar to us. My hope though, is that the highly visible murders of black folks like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Amon Aubrey, and so many others have not been in vain, but have created the kind of clarity for the rest of us that will help allow this movement and commitment to true equity to sustain beyond just this moment. Today, we will ground ourselves in what the research tells us and hopefully have a robust dialogue on how we can change the equation for our next generations of students. The Elevating Voices for Equity series represents Citizen School's commitment to learning and engaging the community and to hear from BIPOC leaders on important topics around educational equity and workforce development. This conversation is the first in a series. Today's topic is focused on K-12 education and how to address, address today's challenges and opportunities and access. We would like to thank all of our sponsors and supporters and friends for their generous commitment. And I will like to offer a special call out to our change maker sponsors, Amazon, Eaton Vance, Fiduciary Trust, and Goldman Sachs. Thank you, thank you for your incredible support and in making uh, the space possible for us to have this conversation. I also like to offer a word about Citizen Schools work during the pandemic. I've been a long supporter and fan of the organization uh, and its work to support students. And that feeling has certainly grown during this difficult period. Citizen Schools has been supporting students, schools, teachers, and communities with remote and hybrid resources and capacity building for deeper student engagement and hands-on experiential, experiential learning. The organization has been providing career mentors who develop and maintain relationships with students when adult connections are critical to student resilience and mental health. Since last spring, Citizen Schools added academic support through a partnership with the Boys and Girls Club and the YMCAs and remote learning opportunities like their career connections, live 30, 30 to 60 minute topics led by career mentors and career pathway videos, videos exposing students to new careers and journeys to get there. Thank you to the students, the teachers, staff, board and supporters of this important work. All right, enough about me, enough me talking. Let's introduce you to the real stars of this time together, um, our panelists. Um, I'd like to say too to the audience, feel free to drop any of your questions in the Q&A during the conversation and the team will help organize and sort those uh, for our later, our later uh, Q&A time with the audience. So panelists, here we go. Again, thank you for making time. Thank you for all the powerful, important work you do in service to our communities. And with that, let's, uh, let's do some introductions. So why don't we do this? Why don't you start off by um, sharing your name, uh, your organization, and maybe one word that embodies 2021 for you. Uh, and maybe take, you know, 30 seconds to a minute, not too much time. I want to get into the, to the meat of the conversation to give some context for that word. So let's get going. Why don't we start with Franklin? Hi, everyone. My name is Franklin Marty, and I am a teacher at with Uncommon School, specifically Roxbury Prep Dorchester campus. And one word that embodies me for 2021 is joy. 
And I know that might sound weird because of everything that's happening right now, but I feel like there has been so many moments last year and even this year already that has threatened to take my joy away from me. And it's something that I refuse to be taken away from me and to give up. And so I make sure every single day that I am protecting my joy. Thank you, Franklin. Jean-Claude. Good morning, Jean-Claude Brizard. I'm currently a senior advisor and deputy director at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. But after this week, I've become the president and CEO of Digital Promise, um, an amazing organization. The one word for me is significance. Um, and sort of coming off the heels of 2020, where I use the word upended. <laughs> so we have significant opportunities to for significant shifts in what we do to really leapfrog inequality. Uh, or if we do nothing, frankly, we just go back five, 10 years from where we were before. Powerful, powerful, thanks. Uh, Amanda. Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Fernandez. I'm the CEO and founder of Latinos for Education. My word for 2021 is esperanza or hope. And hope is what I lead with in 2021 because I've been uh, just very humbled by what I think is um, how so many individuals and organizations throughout the last year have made changes, have, have pivoted their work in service of those communities, Latino and African-American communities in particular that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. And that gives me hope that there is opportunity for change, that we can learn from what we've just gone through and that we can uh, look forward toward what is possible for our students and families across the country. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Bing. Good morning, folks. Uh, my name is Bing Howell. I am Chief Portfolio Officer for Chicago Public Schools and I'm a national board member for Citizen Schools. My word for the year would have to be unveiling. Um, Orlando, per your initial comment, none of this is new for anybody who is in or works closely with these communities, but the pandemic had has made the gaps that exist across our cities and country even more painfully clear who is disproportionately impacted by the status quo and what the end conclusion is if we don't act more comprehe comprehensively to close the gaps in education and in life. Uh, thank you all, thank you all. Joy, significance, esperanza, hope, uh, and unveiling. I, I think the only word I would add, and it, um, I'm channeling, channeling my mom and my dad, but it's, it's fight, you know, we, in times of an in, in incredible crisis and turmoil, I watch my parents and grandparents fight through. And um, I'm committed to do that uh, for the communities that I care so much about. So again, thank you all for, for, for agreeing to do this. Let's get right into the questions. Um, Bing, I'm coming at you first, man. So now that you're warmed up, here we go. Uh, there, are, there are a number of root causes to which we could attribute opportunity and access gaps today, systemic racism, uh, wealth gaps, unequal distribution of resources and more. Uh, please share with us what you think are, are some of the root causes of these, of these gaps. All right, I'm glad I get to go first because I wouldn't wanna follow up anyone on this panel. <laughs> um, but let me be clear, there is no question as to what the root cause of the inequities we are seeing is, none. Like the chapter, the chapters have looked very differently for black and brown communities across this country, but the through lines and narratives have been eerily similar. For blacks in America, if you take the history of our country and map it from slavery to Plessy versus Ferguson, to board versus, Brown versus the Board of Education, to affirmative action, the clear line is the system, whether it be education, healthcare, economy, the justice system, et cetera, um, it is all a meaningful part of this. All of that is accentuated by our individual actions and inactions in enabling the status quo. And then on top of that, there's the stories and the truths that we do and don't tell ourselves about what enables today that actually, that, that enables us to permeate over time. 
all three of these are key portions of enabling the system that is creating these meaningful gaps. And our system is doing exactly what it was designed to do. Now, per my intro comment, COVID has made this even more clear. It's shown us who is falling behind further in virtual learning environments and why. It's showing us who has to go to work to keep our cities going while others get to stay at home, putting them at higher risk of catching COVID. It's showing us who gets to go home to spaces where there are more people than rooms and having worked all day long, increasing the likelihood of spreading the disease. It's showing us who's getting COVID at higher rates, which is exacerbated by pre-existing conditions, which directly link to healthcare challenges. And it's showing us who is dying at higher rates. It is and has factually been the system compounded by our individual actions and hidden by our lack of mass acknowledgement. Not calling all of these out as truths and acknowledging them as comprehensive issues that need to be solved have and will continue to exacerbate these realities. But in confronting these comprehensive challenges within our communities though, we do have a chance. Thank, thanks, Bing. Thanks, man. You know, John Claude, would you would you like to add to that to that um, answer? Uh, absolutely. And and just to follow Bing is gonna be a bit of a challenge. But <laughs> let me let me let me do the following. I think Bing is exactly correct that there's there is no questioning as to the root causes of this issue. But let me sort of invite everyone to think a bit broader about perhaps the, in defining the problem. So many of us look at reading and math scores in K-12 and say, well, we have a huge gap we've got to fill here. But if you were to take the same cohort of young people from early learning all the way to frankly, the, what should be the definition of success, economic mobility, right, or economic stability, if you follow the same group of kids along the way, you begin to really understand all the ways in which kids are falling off the system and frankly leaking out of the system, right? So I can give you examples of states where you may have 70% proficiency in math and reading in third grade, and the same kids have an 8% uh, college graduation, two and four year. Uh, so you can tell which those 8% kids are, right? Uh, they're black, brown, and poor kids are the ones who are falling off the pipeline. If you were to map that and look at the data and follow the data, you can see where, for example, we have this, the kinds of unequitable distribution of resources. In the early grades, uh, the, the kids most in need don't get the best teachers. When you look at the healthcare disparities of moms, black women, brown women who are having children, the kinds of uh, care they get from birth to third grade, you begin to connect all of these dots my point very simply is that we can no longer afford to look at a single data point. You really have to look at all these data points and make the connections to really understand what is causing this. Look, some of it as, as being described is done by design. Uh, we're getting exactly what we designed to actually get. The question then, how do you change the system? It's not one system, it's multiple systems who are interrelated. Um, you can't just attack the K-12 infrastructure. There's a lot of work there as well. But at the same time, you also need to understand all of the enabling factors that support a child in school, what some call whole child, whole community efforts. All these are critically important in making the work um, actually happen. But let me just add one more layer of what, what we have to do on the root cause as well. It's not just changing systems. It's also about shifting the power dynamic to really give parents and families ownership and, and, and the, the, the power to navigate those systems and to change those systems. And I can give you specific examples of places where I'm watching this beginning to happen. It, it's not an either or, it's a both end set of work that we need to do to really get behind all of the multiple factors and root causes that create the kind of disparities you see in, 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 the, in the outcomes. Even one last data point, we are looking at data that shows that if you have a virtual twin, so the brown, black, brown boy and a white boy coming out of the same institution, same program of study, very similar GPAs, yet the economic outcome is vastly different 10 years down the road. That is not a factor of quality of school or quality of program. It is what you see, frankly, in the kind of structural racism you see across both the workplace and what is happening in higher education. So we've got work to do but it's not just one thing we have to do. We have to attack the system as a whole and then we're gonna shift the power dynamic. Wow, Thank, thanks Jean-Claude. And um, uh, thanks for pointing out uh, for me, this idea of um, 
what I often see in philanthropy and in the nonprofit sector, this sort of this sort of siloing and not um, connecting the various broken systems in in, in, in equitable investment in uh, our communities together uh, more powerfully. So so thanks for sharing that. Uh, Amanda Franklin, I'm, I'm coming to you uh, uh, next here. Um, uh, Franklin, what what role does social emotional learning play in student resilience, and how are you seeing SEL competencies addressed uh, most effectively uh, in your work? Thank you so much, Orlando, for this question. Um, I am so passionate about social emotional learning, and um, this is something that has always been important. We know that without the skill of social emotional learning, it is incredibly hard for students to access what they're learning and actually take it in and be strong learners. Um, and I think right now, social emotional learning is even more important because our students are facing a lot more trauma than they have in the past with anxieties about the pandemic, deaths in their families and um, students experiencing COVID themselves. And um, because of that, it's so important for them to be learning, to be gaining social emotional skills that they're able to learn how to deal with these challenges that they're facing right now and learn how to heal, which then allows them to be more resilient. I think the best way that I've been seeing it is a lot more schools and a lot more teachers are prioritizing advisory time or community building time is another way that it's called. And in those spaces, students are taught social emotional skills, but they're also just given a space to be silly, to interact with their friends. They can unmute themselves more freely when they won't necessarily get that opportunity during class time, less pressure to turn their cameras on. And another way I've seen it um, being successful is assessing students to see what their strengths are in social emotional skills and also areas of growth, just like you would assess students in any other class. Um, my students were recently assessed and I was able to get so much knowledge about areas in their social emotional skills that they're doing really well in, but also gain information about areas that they're really struggling with. And right now they're struggling primarily with building relationship with their peers, with optimism, with being physically active, which makes sense because they're spending almost all day in their beds and sometimes even in class, they're still in bed. And so all of these challenges make complete sense for them right now. Um, and I think when we assess our students and what their growths are and what, what they need to, um, what their strengths already are, we're able to use that information in our interactions with them and the questions that we ask them and the activities that we end up doing in the classroom. Thank you, Franklin. Amanda, I was holding a really special uh, question for you, but I saw you head nodding a lot there. Did you wanna add anything to, to Franklin's comments? I, I agree wholeheartedly with all of what Franklin was saying in terms of what should be prioritized right now is SEL for our students and families. And so um, that was really it. That was my head nodding all right, all uh, right. in agreement. So excellent, excellent. Bing, you want to add anything? Yeah, sure. Um, and I, I sort of want to like pull back in ground this in where we started this combo. Um, and from an SEL perspective, just how hard this past year has been for everyone right? But I'd also like to rewind and reflect on what this year showed us about our kids. Now, I think like everybody on this call, one of the things we all inherently believe in is the, the genius and the leadership and the promise of our kids. But if we take, you know, what happened over the summer, this past summer, race rights started happening, protests started happening, and our students were in it. They were making their voice heard, they were carrying their own messages, and they were making sure that what they, they believed should happen was actually happening. And in doing that, they forced systems to listen to them. Um, and on the SAL perspective, 
you know, that's really showing a number of those skills that's really brought to the, to, to the forefront as well. Um, I also want to call out to the countless CPS educators and other educators across the country that made space for these conversations to happen, even when they were challenging and even when they weren't sure how to do it properly, because that was about deepening relationship skills and responsible decision making. Um, and I highlight that all, all to sort of circle back to what Frank, Frank Lean was saying that in starting from an assets based mindset. Um, our students have very strong social emotional skills and they know what they need. So the bigger question for me is like, how do we actually work with them to actually co-create solutions that are going to help get them to where they need to be that's actually informed by them, right? So for me, that's more about highlighting what we're learning, but it's about sitting down with students and sharing the realities of today and exploring with them what any of it means to them. And then it's asking them what supports do they need and being responsive to what we hear. It's also being really centered in the mental trauma um, that exists in these spaces as well. You know, Jean-Claude started off earlier by being able to highlight, you know, the issues that we're talking about are disproportionately like impacted in low income households black and brown households, et cetera. Um, and unless we are, are effectively providing supports um, to actually uplift um, and, and support those very real um, challenge areas, we're really not gonna get to where we need to go anyways. And then lastly, um, if we do both of those things, but we also don't do it from a lens of systematic change of it and actually pulling together the challenges that exist uh, in the healthcare system, the criminal justice system, uh, education. And we're, if we're not doing that together, at best, we're probably gonna get more exceptions to the rule instead of what we're fundamentally trying to do right now, which is actually shift uh, at a systematic level what the outcomes are. Excellent, excellent. Uh, John claude you wanna, you wanna jump in? I think this is a, such an important question and topic. Yeah, it's a topic that's frankly near and dear to me. Part of our strategy in Washington State was always about integration of SEL and in the academics. Um, and my wife happens to be an expert in the field, so I've learned a lot from her as well in looking at this. <laughs> let, me, let me just say something that maybe is uh, just to remind folks. From what I've learned about the science is that the SEL competencies have a more direct link to life success than academic proficiency. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying academic is, is not important. It really is critically important that we get kids, our, our kids to read and write. I want to be clear about that. But when you look at what creates success in life, it is those kinds of things. And the second thing I would push is that some of these competencies, again, looking at the science, have a direct relationship in terms of uh, producing the academic gains we're looking for. For example, executive function, self-regulation, these things are prerequisites for learning. And if some folks think this is a nice to do, I'm going to argue it's a fundamental work that we need to do. And look, if you were to ask me what my kids' reading scores are, I, I don't really know. Um, but I do worry about their social and emotional health and their the competencies they're developing. To me, that's so critically important. And don't get me wrong, I expect the math and reading to be there, but it's a means to an end. The lifelong learning, the lifelong success really comes back to the kinds of development and competencies that frankly we don't do so well in our schools. Uh, th thank, thank, thank you all. Thank you all for that, um, Amanda. All right, um, it's it's our time. <laughs> um, I, I, I have a question. How can we provide student agency, voice and choice? And I think I heard a little bit of this in Bing's comments as well. Mm -hmm. But voice and choice in the in the face of unpredictable and shifting circumstances in our communities. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I think there's a lot of relevance to what was already shared in response to this question, but I'll uh, kind of zero in on something Jean-Claude said earlier around uh, this uh, need to have a shift in power um, as part of the answer here. But what I wanna say um, that I think is foundational around voice and choice for our students and our young people um, foundational to uh, social emotional learning opportunities and, and teaching our kids 
what what that means and how to how to activate their emotions and manage their emotions they're not going to get there unless there's a foundation of trust that has been built within the school setting or uh, a nonprofit setting that is providing services to students and families i start with this foundation of trust because the trust has um, been um, even more impacted between the, our society and our communities of color. That contract has been, um, it was always broken. Actually, there never was one, but I think that there is um, now more than ever this, this sort of mistrust when we even have our families and students um, Latino and African American families are not as confident about the vaccine as an example of sort of where there might be these fissures of trust. And we know that they've existed in our school systems for a long time. And so as I think about this building of trust and what could that mean um, in a school setting or a nonprofit setting um, is really about um, how do we how do we uh, engage our students and what are we doing with our students to affirm their identities, um, to be able to express themselves in different ways, um, not always a survey, but what is, how are they expressing themselves through the enrichment programs, through art and other ways that help to identify sort of where they're at and centering their, their backgrounds, their histories and culture around um, this expression of themselves as a means to build trust. And that's one thing um, I've been thinking about a lot relative to some work um, that Latinos for Education has been involved in around supporting uh, Latino and African-American children through learning pods. And we've learned that by really setting up the systems that affirm our students that um, create opportunities for them in settings where they feel trust and support, that that's going to engender this trust building and um, therefore, I think, open up opportunities for student voice to come out and to feel comfortable that your voice will actually be listened to, affirmed and valued. So that's something um, that I've, I've sort of recognized as something central um, to student voice. I think something else, while it might sound like it's not related, but it, it also to me is sort of a central area of building trust and therefore uh, a desire for students and families to actually give their voice and feel like they can is um, the recognition that we have to communicate with our families in a way that's um, providing them information in the language that they are accustomed to, that is their first language, that they are getting the same amount of information that is um, written in English. These things may seem subtle, but when um, a family is getting information about school reopenings or any other issue regarding schooling, um, if you're not getting the same amount of information as someone else, that's an erosion of trust. That's an erosion of, of not providing equitable access to information. So there's sort of the, the cultural issues that exist within um, our education system that we have to acknowledge that, the, again, there's connection between how the culture that we've set up, how we engage and interact with families that again, leads to an ability or inability for student voice to be activated, to be appreciated and cared about. So these things to me are, are very interconnected. The last thing I'll say is, uh, I think for student voice to be activated, there's a real opportunity for stronger partnership and collaboration with education nonprofits, especially those that are in communities that are community-based where there is trust where families know the people who run the organizations, they've been accessing their services, et cetera. These are other opportunities for our education system to activate student voice 
And it really matters who the messenger is who's asking for student voice. So those would be a few things I would name around how do we engage our students and families um, and provide a setting for them where they feel like they can actually bring their voice to the table and that it will matter. Excellent, excellent. I, I love for uh, Franklin and Bing to get in here. You know, I, I, I want to offer, I spent a big chunk of my early career uh, traveling around the country, training nonprofit organizations on uh, how to authentically engage youth voice and youth leadership. And uh, one, of the, one of the big hurdles were just the, um, the openness to educators and community leaders to see young people as, as powerful as we know they are. Uh, so I worry a little bit, maybe Franklin and Bing, you all can uh, chime in on this. Um, how do we also train educators and those who work with our young people to have that sort of, you know, growth mindset or different perspective on how we value uh, the voices of, of, of our young folks? So um, Franklin, uh, do you want to respond to that question? Yeah, thanks, Orlando. Um, something that I think a lot about is um, just a huge thing that I think impacts agency and how we're empowering our students and their voices and giving them choice is seeing them as experts. Um, our students, they know their experience better than I can ever know their experience. And so the only person who can ever tell me um, or who can really give me accurate information about what they need and what they're struggling with is them. And so I feel like the biggest step is to see students as experts of their own lives, of their own experiences and treating them as those experts. And when you see them as experts, you're a lot more willing to listen and take what they're saying seriously and actually implement it. I think um, I loved Amanda's point about trust and one way to build trust and to keep trust is to actually show that you're listening. If you hear, your student or family see they need something or something is not working, actually changing it and actually um, putting it in place to impact change for them. Um, I loved everything you said, Amanda, but those are the two things that I would I would add on to that and to answer your question to Orlando. Thank you. Bing, can I let you in for a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, anything at this point is a, is a broken record. Um, but at the core of what we're saying, like this is an equity question. Um, and it's about how can we ensure that those that are most impacted by what is being done have a meaningful say in shaping um, what is going to eventually impact them. Um, and the, like from that perspective, I can say like, like the major table turn for me is like pretty much everybody on this call, regardless of where you sit, like we know how to do that, right? You know, we're in scenarios where we actually have a board or a manager and we know how to make sure that we get their feedback. It's actually how do you respect the fact that students are equal stakeholders in that and they actually, as Franklin was saying, have the best ideas about um, what is going to be most beneficial for them. That is a cultural shift. Um, I feel fortunate to, you know, have joined Chicago uh, a little more than a year ago. And this is actually just a mindset. Um, that's consistently being exercised over here to the point where it's not just about the small decisions, it's about the seismically big decisions. Um, right now, one of the things that's happening in one of my departments is we are going through a massive revamp of our school accountability process. And, you know, what we would normally have around that table is that we would normally have, um, you know, researchers, um, psychometricians, educators, district leaders, et cetera. But because we know that we want parents to be able to use it, um, and because we know that they have meaningful perspectives and the same thing for students, we're extending that table and we're accepting the fact that we're gonna be really narrow with the things that are definites. But outside of that, the reality is we have to be really open in regards to perspectives that are meaningfully going to shift if we want the tool to be really transformational. And that's the scary part. Right. Mm. If you if you extend the table beyond what it normally is, you have to be open to the possibility that the outcomes are going to be different. But that's also the point. Powerful. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jean Claude. Uh, there there have been a number of studies done uh, about the long term impact of COVID on 
black and brown students and communities. Please tell us what you think the long-term impact will be uh, and maybe how we can shift those projected outcomes through some specific and targeted actions. Linda, thank you. Let me just start by saying, first of all, that we don't know uh, what the long-term impact is. We have a lot of studies, as you've mentioned, that are looking at the short-term, what we perhaps already know. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about what I'm thinking and what sort of at times worry me. Uh, and maybe a bit of the opportunity that we have in front of us. You may have seen the Bellwater report that shows that we probably can't find nearly 3 million school-aged kids in this country. We have no idea where they are. They're not showing up on, on the platforms. They're not showing up, uh, not engaging in anything whatsoever. And frankly, we don't know where they are. Don't know how to find them. That keeps me up at night, to be really frank. Um, we've seen the NWA um, studies about math, we've, about literacy. We've seen it in McKenzie report. We also know, uh, and I saw this in the world, sort of a World Bank report that shows that if we do nothing worldwide, we run the risk of having young people have lost $10 trillion in economic opportunity. Mm. So that's the long-term impact, frankly, of looking at this worldwide, $10 trillion. We're talking about the kids who are the poorest in this world. And so the, the math you can begin to understand, it's not just what is happening in K-12, what is happening ultimately, it really worries me. We, we know, and we saw it in the um, New York Times had an article on this a few, a few months ago, from looking at national student clearinghouse data, that nearly a quarter of community college kids did not show up in the fall. Uh, the numbers are smaller for four-year institutions or for the elite institutions, even a little bit smaller, still substantial in four-year institutions. And we know who these kids are. Some kids are taking a gap year, right? And the kids who can afford to do that are doing that. But the vast majority of kids who are not showing up, we know will never come back, frankly, in college. Again, when you look at the, the today's workforce, not even the future of work, but today's workforce, you need some post-secondary training to actually be able to succeed in, in that kind of uh, workforce. If these kids don't come back, we are in trouble. So the, the, the long-term economic impact is tremendous just by looking at the, the kids who are in school or go come into college. One more layer to this that really sort of has me worried too, and we've talked about this, is, is I mean, in the and Amanda talked a little bit about this, is the, the, tra the traumatic, the trauma we know exists so we have some inklings and understanding of that, looking at rashes of suicide in, in some districts across the country. But to be frank, we don't really know how deep it goes. I heard saw one report that 4,000 children in New York City had lost at least one parent during, during last spring. Um, so when you begin to, once kids begin to show back in school or not, then, then the real numbers and the real issues will, will come out. So all to say that we are running a couple of studies at Gates uh, with a, um, AIR, we're looking at the long-term impact of COVID in a few states, looking at the entire state geography, places like California, Washington State, uh, Tennessee, uh, New York. So we can sort of understand perhaps the educational issues, but let me just reinforce the fact that the, the level of trauma in, the, in our communities, we don't fully have a grasp yet. And I don't think we're going to, frankly, until um, kids begin to show up back, back in school. But again, we shouldn't sit back and do nothing. There's a lot that we can do. Um, and so really doubling the efforts and, 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 and really engaging communities as Amanda's outline in a real way to get access to families and kids. Uh, let's get boots on the ground to really understand so we can begin to mitigate some of these issues. Uh, otherwise, frankly, we're gonna sit back and come back and, and just really watch how the world has turned on us um, and how many kids frankly, we have lost, not just in the US, but across the world. Wow, thanks. Thanks. Amanda, you want to, would you like to offer some additional perspective? Sure. Uh, I, I uh, was going to also talk about the mental health impacts, and I think Jean-Claude, you already covered that. Uh, we at Latinas for Education uh, over this past summer did, uh, did a report. Uh, we created a report, produced a report that was the impact of COVID on Latino community. And uh, certainly mental health worries were some of the top identified by, by Latino families that we talked to through our surveys and interviews that we did. With that said, we also identified that uh, technology gaps, 
disparities in, in technology access, broadband access um, are very real. And uh, we saw that, right, with uh, many school districts across the country um, not sort of being able to provide devices. Um, and then, then broadband was also just not, not very accessible for a lot of families, strong internets, et cetera. We all see the images in our minds of the students sitting at the fast food restaurant trying to do their homework um, during the pandemic. So, so we at Latinos for Education have doubled down on the issue of tech equity as something that we think is a way to um, address multiple issues in, um, that, that are being exacerbated through COVID. We know that telehealth cannot be accessed if you don't have broadband. We know that you can't access other social services, that it's hard to access information from your schools if you don't have access to technology and quality broadband. So one solution I'll, I'll name and something that we've been able to do very quickly here in the state of Massachusetts is to work with the legislature. And uh, we've added an amendment to the budget of 2021, it was approved. And there will be a tech equity commission that's supported by the education committee of the, of the Massachusetts State Legislature that is bringing together educational uh, institutions and organizations, the telecom companies, business groups, et cetera, to really think about how do we address the tech equity issues that exist in our state that can be uh, a focus to eliminate so that not only do we support educational opportunity but the access that our families and communities need, that our students need to be successful in school and to have the services and access that they need uh, for all of the needs that they have. Awesome. Um, my uh, biggest job is to make sure we stay on time here. And so I think what I'm gonna uh, do is bring the audience in a bit. Um, uh, we have on the call um, K-12 educators, community leaders, uh, folks who care deeply about young people. Uh, what I might ask you to do is to just drop into the chat uh, what you will do to actively support uh, BIPOC students in the coming year, uh, your big, bold ideas. We'll see those things uh, sort of running through the list to inspire us all. Um, and I might ask one or two panelists to share what they would recommend to the audience um, as a big, bold idea. And if we can do it a little rapid fire panel, I know it's not ideal uh, for big, bold ideas, um, but I do wanna make sure we, we leave plenty of time for, for Q&A. So um, if folks have ideas that they wanna share, maybe in you know 30 seconds or so, I, I, that'd be great. Uh, John Claude, I'll start. I'll start quickly. So one of the things that I'm already thinking about in my new role at Digital Promise is how do we convene the best and brightest in in the U.S. and maybe even around the world. But let's start with the U.S. first. Let's say 15, 25 people in a room. Let's figure out exactly what needs to be done now, the next six months. So we can, so. I, I'm afraid that we have a lot of disparate groups doing different things. Um, we've got to come to consensus and say, we've got an emergency. We've got kids in the emergency room. Let's get five doctors and figure out what is the best course of treatment to really mitigate and at the same time look to reinvent uh, the system. But it has to happen now. Let's get our best people in the room and figure this out. Great, great. Thanks, man. Franklin? Something I'm thinking a lot about is um, how teachers and just educators in general in schools can do a better job of listening and catering to the people that we serve, um, especially the communities that we're in. Um, asking the community, what do they need from the students that we're serving? What um, do your community need? That's something that I'm thinking a lot about, um, just listening more and making sure that we are catering to the needs of the communities and the people that we're serving. Thanks, Franklin. Bing? Ashe, I'm going to hop on to Franklin's. Um, it's not a big bold, it's a big basic. 
Um, how can everybody, based off of where they're sitting, um, extend the table to student, parent of like the communities that we're, that we're aspiring to serve and make sure that you're using your power to actually increase the likelihood of their voices being heard um, and recommendations being taken. Awesome. Uh, Amanda, you want to take 20 seconds uh, to build on your, your, uh, your thoughts? Sure. Earlier? Thank you. So I would say that there is real opportunity and I think uh, there's a recognition that collaboration has to be much better. So I think our systems at the system level of working across schools, government, philanthropy, our education nonprofits and really centering students, students of color in that work of cross sectoral collaboration is super important. And we all can talk a good game on that, but it can be done. And it just means that we have to center students and families and a collective vision for what we want in our, in our cities, our state and our country. Really, really, really uh, powerful panelists. I, I think I'm gonna turn to questions now, but um, if you're out in the audience, give, give snaps, applause, whatever, we can't see you. Uh, but I'm sure we can feel the love. Really, really powerful uh, panelists. Thank you so much for uh, for your for your thoughtful responses. So let's go to let's go to Q Q and A. Um, I think the team is going to be shooting me some questions. Um, let's see, question from audience. Let's see, um, how might you see the connection between SEL? and STEM programs with cultural organizations, museums, zoos, aquarium, et cetera. Um, let's see. I can't see if anybody's raising their hand. Bing, let me go to you, man. Um, I am asked like on this question, I'd really defer to anybody on the citizen school side that would actually like to unmute. Um, so I, so my first job in the United States in the education space was leading civic engagement and development at citizen schools in the New Jersey office. Um, and the reality is, is like one of the reasons why I'm continuing to engage with the organization um, on the board is because like the organization is the embodiment of it takes a village. Right. And so in regards to like, hey, we have a number of students that are in schools where you don't have access to the resources that need them. How do we bring that to life? How do we bring it to life with their families? How do we make learning real? How do we not just focus on the K-12 learning, but also focus on, you know, their ability to communicate, engage, persevere? How do we make sure that they're seeing success and they're feeling success semester after semester at a really, really critical age? That's the core. Of, of, of what the model has actually done. So I would maybe a weird uh, deferral, but you know, Emily, if you'd be open to sharing a bit more about that special sauce um, and what that tie looks like, because I think that it is one of the critical pieces to, to answering this question. Emily, you, Emily, you've been tagged in. Can you, uh, can you hear us? Can you, can you join? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Bing, I think you said it beautifully. I, I will share just one thought on this, which is, I think kids need, kids are learning all of the time, right? And they are not only learning in school, they are learning after school, they are learning in the evenings, they're learning in the summer. How can we create a seamless experience for them where they feel a sense of safety, around self-expression, where they feel a sense of discovery and curiosity and where the values around a growth mindset and empathy are reinforced consistently. Um, STEM is just lends itself so naturally to exploration and curiosity um, and to a growth mindset, because if you've ever created a hypothesis, it's most likely been wrong the first time. So how can schools and organizations like citizen schools or museums really think about a joint agenda to create that seamless experience for kids um, where those same social emotional skills are rewarded and where they have caring adults who are surrounding them um, and helping them to grow as individuals and to improve their content understanding over time. So I'm gonna back back out, but- yeah. um, Emily, but stay on the panel, stay on the panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. Uh, here, 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 here. Yeah. 
Sure, just quickly, sure. Just quickly, just quickly sure. Yeah, so it was really well said, Emily. I put a link in the chat to the panelists and to all the attendees about a very specific school in Tacoma that is a STEM-focused school that lives in this aquarium. So a zoo in an aquarium and the high school lives there. It's fully integrated. And of course, they're all about SEL and the academic integration in that particular school. So look at the website. Maybe not a long-winded answer, but a good example of what the question is. Looking. Yeah, a, another really good audience question. How do we engage parents without overwhelming them uh, during this time? Uh, which I thought is a good question. If anybody wants to, to jump in there. I, I think it's relatively dangerous um, to try to come up with a universal answer. Um, and I think it's mostly about being able to meet parents where they're at. And so it's making sure that, you know, each school or partner organization has an understanding of which parents want to engage at which, which level using which technologies, right? Um, some parents is going to be texting, some it's email, some they actually prefer, prefer phone calls, some want more communication engagement, some actually are comfortable less, some don't have the ability to do more. Um, but it's being able to sort of codify and, and document what those preferences are and being able to make sure you have the right message to meet each parent where they're at. And as Amanda was sharing, even the nuances of, you know, even in the language um, that makes them feel comfortable and engaged, um, that is potentially, um, if I'm being overly optimistic, an opportunity in this window. Because between schools and uh, nonprofit partners um, and this COVID environment, this is a forced equation where education, educators have to be in the homes of families. Now we could go back to the regular world once everything opens up, or this could have been a window where we all struggled together and got closer together and we build from there. But what? But the answer to that question, Orlando, like what we do with 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 that 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 forced scenario is going to dictate whether we're better or worse off by the time it's all done. Let, I'll just add uh, an anecdote to the question. Um, so, so I agree that it will take a diverse set of communications methods that our families and kids need uh, based on what they specifically will respond to. and. Uh, one of the participants, Claudia, uh, mentioned in the chat work that the Brockton Public Schools are doing, and I think that example is a very good one. So thanks for sharing that, Claudia. Uh, I would also say that uh, from an anecdotal perspective, uh, communications coming out in particular from our schools is, it's very overwhelming. There's a lot of it, and I'm I'm seeing and hearing that for, by and large, it's being ignored because families just can't keep up because everyone has other issues they're dealing with and very serious ones. So I would, I would err on the side of the more meaningful communications and also communications that help students and families be seen, that they are understood, that what they're experiencing is being uh, taken into account, and and that is what you'll you'll um, that's what will foster connection and then desire from a student and family to want to engage in what a school is communicating to them. Well, can I to really I mean, thank you? I mean, a practical advice too, as a parent with young children who are hybrid virtual, et cetera, is sort of unify the message. Like when my kid's school uh, is in middle school, all the information comes from one teacher, the advisory teacher, not getting eight different messages every few days. Look, as a parent who works full time, I get overwhelmed, frankly, as an educator, I get overwhelmed with the amount of information. I can't keep up with the emails that comes from multiple places. So try as, as much as possible, yes, multiple ways of, 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 of inviting access, but if there's communication from the school, please aggregate them in a way that makes it easy for digest, for, 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 for parents to digest. Otherwise, we begin to ignore emails, frankly. Excellent. Excellent. Hey, this, this has been a, a, a powerful uh, conversation. I, I can't uh, thank the panelists enough. 
Can't thank citizen schools and the sponsors enough for creating the space for this kind of conversation. We need to create many more spaces like that. We have to stay committed to that. Um, so Jean-Claude, Amanda, Bing, Franklin, uh, thank you for the, the time you've given uh, to this conversation, but also um, the amazing work you do to support uh, our communities. Um, you know, it's, it's hard for me to pull out uh, all the themes. I mean, some powerful, powerful comments in the chat. Uh, so many nuggets that uh, the panel has shared. Um, there are a few that jump out at me personally. These, these are among my, my favorites, starting off with uh, the words that folks shared around joy, significance, hope, unveiling. Um, but I heard John claude talk about the unequitable distribution of resources. We must pay attention to that. I heard Frank Clean talk about um, the importance of social emotional learning at this time, especially um, And many of the panelists talk about um, the direct impact of social emotional learning uh, on the success we want to see for our children and communities. Um, Amanda talked powerfully about trusting our young people and Franklin added on that we must see them as experts. Uh, and John Claude and being just um, uh, masterful at talking about the importance of data. Like we, 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 have to, we have to follow the data to know the data, but also so we um, are working to create effective um, projects, programs, interventions, uh, cross-cutting strategies um, that truly meet the unique needs of our, of our community. So again, I can't thank everyone enough. Um, please join us virtually for our next Elevating Voices for Equity event on Thursday, March 11th. We will discuss post-secondary education with our moderator, Tarlyn Ray, VP of College Connections at the College Board, uh, Dr. Tiffany Mfume, AVP of Student Success and Retention at Morgan State, Tyrone, Tyrone Hill, Maker Fellow at Morgan State University, and Dr. Aloy Ortiz Oakley, Chancellor at California Community College. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to uh, being in work and community with you all in the future.